Transformers, The Covenant of Primus, by Justina Robson. First published, 2013, by 47 North. Foreword. To this day, I could not tell you the very beginning of our story, how Primus came to be, nor why, nor when. Though my curiosity burns me greatly, I have had to be satisfied with looking at the Covenant's hidden stories, written in codes I cannot decipher, knowing that they exist, and knowing that there was a beginning. Yes, there is a first page, and prior to that there is a blank page, but that is all. Today I have set myself the task of translating and editing the Covenant of Primus, so that it is meaningful for human contemplation. Since our fates are now entwined as galactic neighbours, you should have the opportunity to gain a greater understanding of who we are and where we have come from. The Covenant is our history, a full and lengthy record of which this is only a fragment. But I hope that it provides a worthwhile and illustrative fragment that will satisfy your curiosity and allow you to develop a richer understanding of the personalities you have so lately met. For the ease of your reading pleasure, I have translated many Cybertronian proper nouns, pronouns, and phrases into English, and into Earth-normative concepts also. In doing this, I hope that I have not caused confusion or overstepped my authority in the use of your languages and customs. It has long been our habit to observe alien cultures, and to attempt to make ourselves intelligible to them in their own terms, wherever we can, be it in physical form, language, or manner. Where a significant deviation from Cybertronian culture cannot be avoided, I shall make a note in the text. Alpha Trion Chapter 1 The Thirteen Primes I am. No moment but the present lies within me. I am as empty as the spaces between the stars. They are the first thing I see, the first thing I know. In the next quantum of time that passes, I am aware of what and who I am. I know the stars are above me, and the solid metal body of the planet is beneath me. This world that supports me is the titanic, semi-hibernating Primus, the demigod who created me. I have a name. I am Alpha Trion, third of the Thirteen Primes. A split cycle later, Solus appears to my left out of thin air. There is a flash as she takes form and the ground quakes. Lightning surrounds her in a nimbus that reaches out and crackles into my nerves. I marvel that I can be blinded and shocked and that I can recover from this. Everything is new, everything is a wonder, even pain and fright. Then, with a series of resounding booms, the next nine are made, one after another, to complete our lineup, Shrouded in the glowing golden light of the Energon burst that accompanies this explosive creation, Thirteen's first gesture is to salute with his arm raised. A sign of victory and greeting marks the mighty effort of imagination and will that has made us. He is the last prime, and he completes us. I raise my arm too, to my right and left, all do the same. Our first action is unified. Knowledge of our destiny unspools in our minds in a steady cascade as Energon fills our bodies with life and power. Primus's work is done. In concert, we will do what he could not. We are his successors, and in our creation he has drawn this phase of his life to a close. I turn to him automatically across the comms net, son to father, but even as I do so his presence is already fading away. He switches down from conscious flow to hypersleep with a gentle glide of unravelling synaptic processes. The last we know of him is a feeling of quiet faith, which he has for each of us. He has given us everything of himself, and there is nothing more to say. I feel bereft to gain and lose so much in a single minute. Between joy and grief I am torn into silence. Beside me, the other primes stand. Titans astride a reclining god, filled with awe. We look at one another. We look at the world, 
the vast skies, the sprays of light that are stars and galaxies, and the near infinite reaches of the universe that extend beyond our ability to see or hear or know. As far as we can tell, there is nothing here but us and our dormant world. But if there were truly nothing, there would be no need for our existence, and that thrilling and disturbing knowledge is reflected in all our eyes as we turn to face one another. Then, as our awareness unifies, our spirits draw together. We are granted a fleeting glimpse of what has gone before as the past unfurls before our mind's eye. Ages ago, before time had measure, there was a single being. It had no use for identity or name. It lived. And this was enough for a while. But as it explored the galaxy and began to find other living beings, the bliss of discovery gave way to disturbing thoughts that had no answers. If they are this, and they are many, what am I? And why am I alone? Having nobody else to talk to, it began a conversation with itself, and gradually evolved two distinctive voices, with which it examined the different sides of matters. One was reassuring, full of faith and acceptance. The other was restless and relentless, comparing itself with what it found and discovering that there were flaws and needs that went unanswered in the vast emptiness of space. The two voices took names to themselves. One was Primus, meaning first and one, and the other named himself Unicron, meaning unique and one. They both knew that they were one being, but this act separated them into two pieces whose feelings and insights could not be reconciled. They were the essence of opposition, and being young and without guidance, they began to fight, each thinking his way was correct and that the other was a fool. The more they argued, the more they felt in danger from each other's existence. The division of mind and spirit caused a separation in form so that ultimately they divided physically as well as in every other way. In spite and disappointment, Unicron became rapacious and destructive, and Primus grew withdrawn and resentful. For a long time they could not truly part and travelled together, Unicron rampaging and Primus attempting to prevent him and make reparation. Primus made overtures to reconcile, but Unicron had found a sense of self that was enlarged by his contempt for others. He would not surrender it to return to the fundamental uncertainty from which he had arisen. His refusal filled Primus with righteous rage, and so began billions of stellar cycles of struggle between them. Even their bodies altered, in accordance with the reality each of them had created within his mind. Now Unicron roved the galaxy on a binge of destruction, bent on the erasure of all life, in the belief that this would give him peace. Primus grew in the conviction that it was his duty to stop Unicron's devastation and to preserve what joy was left for others as long as it could be made to last, for both of them understood that one day even they would cease to exist. Primus taunted Unicron that all he must do is sit and wait for entropy to do his work for him. The universe would die in heat and chaos regardless of his actions. Unicron replied in kind that Primus should assist him to prevent the creation of more living beings in a world of suffering and disappointment. They were still irrevocably locked together in spite of all they had done to separate. Being evenly matched, neither could best the other for long. Primus realised that unless something changed, neither would ever prevail. Therefore, he decided to withdraw from the conflict and from his role in it. We return to the present moment and our new selves. Though we may not see Unicron yet, we can feel his presence. He scrapes the edges of our collective awareness with his claws. He is the eye of a storm that crushes planets, assimilates suns. Each ingestion increases his power. Between bouts of fury he pauses, sated for a moment, into remembering his rival self. The dread radiation of his stare searches for Primus. But Primus sleeps the sleep of the dead. 
and the stair washes across us in a blast of dark particles, missing us, as Primus had intended. Unicron is so used to seeing the brilliance and focus that was our ancestor that he doesn't see any of us at all. He does not imagine that Primus would simply vanish. We do not have long before he thinks to come looking. These are my first records, as memory of the Primes. I will record everything, even the inglorious matters. To help me, I have been given two objects of immense power, the Covenant and the Quill. The Covenant takes the form of a book at this moment in time, although it could take many forms. The Covenant is an object, like the Quill, whose form is contingent upon its function, and at any given point in space-time. It is linked in quantum pairs that join its physical analogue, in this case a book, with its pure informational state stored at the universe's holographic rim, always present but completely out of reach. The first entry in the Covenant was not, as I had hoped, the story of Primus's origin, and his maker or his place of construction. There was indeed text before our point in time, a great deal of it, but it was in a cipher I could not and never have been able to decrypt. Therein lay the facts, written clearly, perhaps to indicate that there was a reason and a completion to matters, whether or not it was comprehensible. The Covenant continued, suddenly switching into legible Cybertronian. And so the thirteen primes were created. Each one was different and given unique abilities, gifts and flaws, which allowed a far greater set of potentials than any one being was capable of embodying alone. Primus knew that this was his best chance to defeat Unicron, since the enemies had fought one another to a standstill, times without number. They were composed of forces that were in true opposition, like the polarities of a magnet, and every action they took was met by an equal and opposite reaction. In order to change the outcome of their struggle, it was necessary to change the nature of the fight. So Primus altered the only variable that was in his power to change, himself. He removed himself from the field of battle. In his place he created the Primes, and gave to each one of them an equal portion of his power, but he did not make them in his image, as tiny copies who would face the same impossible task. Each Prime was crafted to express not only those driving principles that animated Primus, but also elements that were akin to Unicron. He gave us the ability to choose freely between all the binary opposites, so that we need not be trapped as he had been, but would always be able to change in any moment and so escape into more and more possibilities. And that power would be multiplied thirteenfold. In mathematical terms alone, this was a shift from certainty, moving from the state of oneness to very high unpredictability, 13 to the power of 13, a vast number of opportunities. To say that we were all a collection of traits and artefacts would be to render us no more than vehicles or objects. Yes, we were made in a calculated way, but from each combination our personalities naturally emerged as the fused sum of that and surpassed it in every case. And as soon as we began to interact, we began subtly to change one another. My second act as memory was to ask the others to make their marks in the definitive history of our universe. This book, The Covenant of Primus. I give below the truth of who they were at the beginning, in the order in which they were made, before anything happened that could change us from the purity of Primus's intent. Let it be the first record, so that later we will remember ourselves our innocence. For we were all innocent. Primer Primer was the archetypal hero, a warrior made closest to Primus's own types and intents, focused on the greater good. Such people can be dull, but Primer was clever and unselfish, with a strong sense of self-awareness, so that even as he remained true to his principles, he was always able to stay one step away from pomposity. He cared for all of us like the eldest brother of a large and unruly family, taking too much upon his shoulders, perhaps. 
As Primus did, he was convinced he was both right and in the right all the time, which made him a frustrating person to deal with on occasion, but stood him in good stead when it came to a fight. His weapon was the Star Sabre, a sword of an item type like the quill, whose form was symbolic of its power rather than the actual full limit of it. Its edge could cut between atoms with the accuracy of the finest tool or sunder mountains. Vector Prime Vector was a serious, stoic personality with a very narrow view of correctness. Primus was always right, and by extension, as a creation of Primus, Vector himself could not be in the wrong. Like Primer, he was close to the Maker. His sense of balance and order was unsurpassed, and just as well, for his power lay in the manipulation of time and space. He was able to create and to prevent paradoxes as it suited him, to distort or to mend the fabric of our physical reality. He carried many weapons in battle, including a sword and a staff, but his personal artefact of power was the Blades of Time. This, in spite of its name, was not a weapon, but a mandala made up of many separate pieces which could fit together in a nearly infinite variety of ways. Depending on the pattern formed, it granted him access to hidden dimensions through which he could move at will and in which he performed his intricate weavings and unravelings. Alpha Trion I, Alpha Trion, was made to be the historian of the Primes and the memory of Primus, in case Primus was ever recalled to life. It was my nature to be detached, although I don't believe I was uncaring, I took a philosophical attitude, an analytic appreciation of others and their deeds. I was gifted with two artefacts, the Covenant, which truly came from and belonged to Primus himself, and in which must be written by Primus's will, and the Quill, with which I wrote my own observations. Unlike all other Primes and subsequent beings of the same lineage, I was given total recall and a direct link to the spark of Primus through which I was sustained and inspired during times when the accumulated knowledge and awareness of events could have been otherwise intolerable. Solus Prime The Creator Solus was a calm and confident person who was beloved by all the other Primes, both for her positive and intelligent support as a friend, and also for her ability to create instruments and objects of any kind, something she would readily do for any Prime who asked her. However, she had a fierce temper and was easily angered by anything that smacked of injustice as Primer and Vector before her. Her personal artefact was the forge, a hammer in appearance. She used this together with the creation lathe, a holographic projection that her body created in three dimensions around her whenever she was working. It was an intuitive and sensory ability that manifested visually this way to help her design the specific architecture and engineering components of the objects she was working on. On its own, the forge was a poor instrument, able to create, to mend, to smash to oblivion, whatever it touched. Rather, it was the lathe, and Solus herself, who supplied the vision and the labour behind its actions. When Solus created an entire armour set with a single swing of the mighty device, there were stellar cycles of thought, refined and tempered to absolute precision in its arc and anvil strike. I note at this point, for those of you who may be curious, the Primes, and later the Transformers, do not have gender in the same way that humans and certain other biological species do. Here, Solus Prime, and those who were later formed in her lineage, are referred to as she in order to comply with your human gender reference terms and to show a distinction that Cybertronians recognise amongst themselves, though other races do not. To Cybertronians, there are two distinctive kinds that we easily divide ourselves into, recognising key feature differences in the manner in which information is processed. It is widely supposed among the remaining primes that this difference was necessary for Solus herself to operate the creation lathe, which required a vast capacity for wide-ranging and parallel thought processing. After becoming part of a wider galactic community, we adopted the habit of using a gender reference protocol when interacting with gendered alien species in order to demonstrate that we are not unfamiliar with the notions of difference and equality. We recognise our difference. We celebrate our equality. 
In early pre-contact Cybertronian notation, however, all primes and others are referred to by a single symbol. I note that in human terms there is a rough one-to-one -one ratio of male to female that does not correspond to our one-to-twelve distinction, and I apologise to any females of the species who may feel slighted at having had their pronoun applied to the less numerous type of Cybertronians. Micronus Prime Micronus was tiny in comparison to the rest, fast, volatile, and containing more energy packed inside him than four of the others put together. What he lacked in scale he more than made up for with his mind, always coming up with a sensible suggestion or clever plan. He was a watchful observer too, so he often knew what was going on with the others even before they did. Primus intended him to be the conscience of the rest, and he took his role seriously. His innocent nature made him an immediate friend of Solus and those like her, though the early primes were too sombre for his taste. At war he had an amazing ability to connect with other primes, and boost their power output for incredible feats of strength or endurance. With his allegiance they were never outgunned. He had his own artifact too, the Chimera Stone. This enabled him to connect with the other primes and to direct his energy in the form that suited them. He was also able to mimic their abilities for a while after the Chimera Stone had bonded him to them. Alchemist Prime Alchemist was one of the more mystical primes, an elemental being who perceived the world in terms of its basic forms, spiritual or material, and who was attuned to its cycles. He was much more intuitive than intellectual, although he lacked no intelligence. As with all the rest, he was capable of handling himself in a fight, but he preferred to immerse himself in the natural world to better understand the mechanisms of change. In his ability to transmute metals and temporarily alter their properties of objects, he seemed more akin to a magician than a battle master. He had a gentle spirit that led him to be sympathetic to all the rest. Still, waters run deep, as the humans say. I was his closest friend, our joint scholarly approaches providing us with endless debate. His ability to always see another side to any story was aided by his artefact, the lenses. As these were part of his optics and integral to his being, they were not something anyone else could ever hope to use. Nexus Prime like Alchemist and the others in the middle strata, where Primus and Unicron's energies were most balanced, Nexus had an elemental quality, but in him it was as if elements circulated constantly in an exciting mixture, broaching chaos but never tipping into it, with Nexus riding the edge of the wavefront, a daredevil free spirit. This mercurial elusiveness was reflected in his face, which changed constantly, not only in reaction to his feelings, but apparently just because moving form was something it had to do. Although later legend would say that Nexus was chopped into bits, the fact is he was the first combiner. Made as a single being, he could readily drop into five separate parts, each with its own body and personality. Even after spending cycles apart on different projects, these bots would reunite happily and become Nexus once again, without any loss or struggle. He was their sum, and they were joyously his fragments, all sufficient unto themselves. Change and recombination were his nature. Although he was at heart loyal to Primus, and had no time for the deeper darknesses of some of his other brethren. His artifact was the Enigma of Combination, it is not possible to say what it looked like, as it could look like anything. A weapon, a jewel, a body part. And its power was already manifest in all that he did. Onyx Prime Where Alchemist was most in tune with nature in the form of elements, Onyx was more like a beast. He was capable of travelling in spirit across time or space, thanks to his artefact, the Triptic Mask. The three faces of the mask allowed him to freely access his own subconscious and the roots of living awareness in all creatures. He shared a vision with beings he could never meet, across distances he could never travel, gaining knowledge from other ways of being so alien that the rest of us would not even recognise them. This ability made him seem powerful and a little frightening at times, and his alpha nature made him play this up. 
the first mask at the top of the totems was named Farsight. This opened visions into other places and times, many real, some unreal. He knew the difference. But nobody else who tried to see it could tell what was truth and what was some distant creature's dream. The second mask in the centre of the column was Predator. This gave him immediate insight into any creature so that he could hunt it faultlessly. The third mask was the strange undead face of Mournsong. It was alive and vigorous on the back, but cold and empty on the front, and gave visions that only Onyx was able to comprehend. He reported faithfully, watching me write it down, that Mournsong shows the journey of a spark across the hidden regions of death. Onyx was the only prime so powerfully attuned to spirit. Some considered him illogical and fanciful, but there was a burning, friendly loyalty about Onyx that simply made him good to be around. He was inspiring, and for that he was unique in being the friend of all primes. Amalgamous Prime Amalgamous was the joker of the pack, though never cruelly so. His gentle fun-poking was great light relief, even as it pushed at the comfort zones of the others, the more serious sometimes taking it rather badly. His artefact was a scythe, although you would hardly know it as. Uh, like the rest of his body, it was in constant flux, transforming from one shape to another, one state to another, liquid to solid, and back again. Bright and cheeky, Amalgamus was never still, and given half a chance would be tinkering with anything to figure out how it worked and what it would do. He lacked the seriousness and focus of a true fighter, although his unpredictability was an asset sometimes. He was not the most forward-thinking or bright of the sparks among the primes, but he was gentle at heart. The archetypal shifter, he never lingered where he wasn't welcome, but simply moved on, not taking anything personally, not holding grudges or remembering deeds. His memory slipped as easy as his shape, although it had an odd way of suddenly sharpening when something important happened. His artefact was the transformation cog, from which all later T-cogs would be modelled. Quintus Prime Quintus was an innocent daydreamer, with a strong tendency toward perfectionism and idealism. He constantly sought expression of his ideas, and was driven to prove his theories correct by experimental invention. In this he was often stimmied by the less imaginative primes, who had no time for his speculations, but he had a mind second to none, and was unwilling to let it lie fallow just for the sake of peace and quiet. He believed overwhelmingly that life was the most important, sacred thing, to be encouraged to flourish at all costs and in all varieties to enrich the universe. His unique power was embodied in the Ember Stone, an object akin to Primus's spark, which was able to seed the explosion of living processes in base elements. Liege Maximo Maximo was the talker, the manipulative one, who could bend words and thoughts much more easily than metal. His silvered tongue was capable of the most eloquent charm, and he soon learned how to pitch whatever line he was selling to the person in question, tailoring his language and methods to exactly match their desires or to feed their suspicions. He was often watchful and quiet, absorbing, calculating, he had a knack for instantly understanding where the nuts and bolts of a person were hidden, where their secret switches lay. He was made to triumph with schemes where outright conflict failed, or to avoid conflict by manoeuvring in advance. His diplomacy was favoured by a general likeable quality that made his sympathy feel very genuine, and I believe that it was. He threw himself wholeheartedly into any role he thought would work, becoming instantly convincing even to himself. The power these skills gave him over others, most of whom were naive at this point, was incalculably immense. The other primes were not ready for someone as many-faced as he could be. He realised this with characteristic speed, and from the outset began crafting himself a hidden path to power, directly beneath the nose of Primer, who couldn't even imagine such plots. His artefact was the Legion Darts. There were actual darts, filled with toxins of all kind, 
which he could deploy to disrupt others, but the real darts were his words and his thoughts, their barbs and their effects unsurpassed by mere physical objects. Megatronus A warrior in the mould of Prima, Megatronus was his dark antithesis. He was also the most complex of all the Primes, caught between warring impulses of immense passion that never allowed him peace. His dedication to Primus was unswerving, but faced with Primus's nature on a daily basis, and Primus' emulation of it, he could not help but see himself as an outsider, forever damned by the very powers that gave him such terrifying strength. His ruthlessness, ambition, conviction, and ability to take any course of action gave him near limitless potential. At the same time, he felt these qualities earned him the disfavour of the other primes. He was too like Unicron. They turned their gaze away when his burning visage confronted them. It haunted him. He had done nothing wrong, never did, and yet he felt he was unworthy. The injustice of it scored his spirit. It seemed that he took on the burdens of darkness at his own expense, while the rest could feel assured of their rightness, not having to soil their hands with grim compromises. He was too proud to recognise how vulnerable this left him, as he could never admit any weakness. He covered his fears with zealotry. Even with those closest to him, Maximo, Solus, Micronus and Onyx, he could blow hot or cold depending on how his paranoia fared. He was unstable. His personal artefact was crafted for him later by Solus Prime at his request and design. The Requiem Blaster was a weapon that drew on the burning core of distant suns, casting beams that were of such an intensely focused plasma that no material could survive their passage. The Thirteenth prime. Thirteen was unlike the other primes. His type was warrior, a physical adept with the leadership and intellectual fortitude of kings. Where Megatronus was riddled with contradiction, Thirteen had no such troubles, and was perhaps, as a result, far lesser in ego than any of the other late primes. At this time of our making, he was quiet and dutiful, obedient to Primer's commands, and dedicated to assisting those who required it. He was like Primer's second, but unlike the rest, he had no special object or weapon associated with him, taking up only those lesser tools crafted by Solus and his armour as he was instructed. This would seem odd if we did not all know that his true purpose was as mediator and visionary. Thirteen was an inspirational speaker and a deep thinker with a calm soul. His steady, perceptive nature meant he was well-liked, and he pulled his weight. He used to comfort others in times of stress, with a friendly hand on the shoulder, and the words, All are one. There was a contented light in him that made us believe it. Even Megatronus could be calmed this way when he came in from one of his great battle rages foaming with his own pursuance and resentment. Thirteen united us. Without his influence, we would have fallen into disarray far sooner. Here ends the first entry in this covenant of Primus, the legacy of all knowledge about Cybertron and the beings that live thereon. <laughs>